Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome to episode two of our campaign game with Sherman Leader, the 2017 tactical war game from Danvers and Games. In episode one, we set up our campaign. In episode two, it's time to dig into the action. So let's get started with the first battle of our first week of this three week campaign. So to start out the first week, the very first thing we need to do is to draw a special condition card, which is gonna to apply to the entire week's operation. Some of these are positive, some of these are negative. Let's see what we get. Enemy offensive. Add two to all non-fixed support and non-fixed command operational move rolls. Okay, so what this means is at the end of the turn, we're gonna move the enemy battalions forward or they're gonna hold their position. So we're gonna, this is more likely that the support and command battalions will move forward. This actually probably won't have too much of an effect because we are added by the nature of our scenario and invasion, we're adding five to their dice roll. So it makes it pretty much certain that everything that can move of the enemy is gonna to move towards us. But we kind of knew that already. So not too bad for a negative event to happen in this first week. Next up for the weekly actions, we have to determine which one of our units are going to participate in which battles and which battalions we're going to attack. We're gonna attack two enemy battalions in this first week. The first one is gonna be the scout force, which is very close, which is actually on our front lines. So we wanna make sure we hit this one. Then the second attack we're gonna do, which is gonna have eight of our units, is gonna go after this infantry battalion. This is a lot of units, and it also has a special rule where infantry spawn during the battle. So our next episode, this'll be a big battle. This one is a smaller force, and we're gonna send four of our units against this. <clears throat> so we're gonna send two armor and two infantry to tackle this scout force, and that's gonna be our battle for this episode. We'll show these units in more detail going forward, but here's our four commanders and four units we're taking into the first battle. Sergeant Conksel is gonna be on our Stuart. Sergeant Tawanda is gonna be on our Wolverine. Sergeant Graham is taking our machine gun team, and then Sergeant Kelly, our raw recruit leader, is gonna be taking our inexperienced rifle team into battle. Now that we've assigned our units for the week and picked our special condition card, we are into our first battle. The first thing we do is we pick an event card for this battle. Some of these again are positive, some are negative. Fingers crossed we get something good. Enemy convoy. You may inflict one stress on each commander to gain one victory point. So this is an interesting decision. Uh, one victory point is actually uh, fairly significant because we're only going to get three victory points for destroying this whole battalion and 18 victory points gives us the optimal win condition. So one victory point for four stress, one on each one of our commanders, is pretty, pretty substantial gain. However, just as a kind of a side factor, this is Sergeant Kelly and he at three stress, he is shaken and he's going to pick up two just from being in the battle plus whatever else happens to him in the battle could add more stress. And if he gets more than four stress, gets five, he's broken and we'll probably have to drop him from the campaign. But that one victory point is pretty big. And just for the sake of let's try it and see what happens, we're gonna do this one. So we're gonna add one stress to Kelly, Graham, Consul, and Tawanda and pick up that victory point. The next step in the, in the battle is to build the map. And just to kind of show how this works, we've got eight of these European tiles and I've randomly kind of dumped them onto the map with their arrows facing up and this is our map here. So now let's take a look in just an overhead view of this map and kind of talk about how it might impact the battle and what our thoughts might be. So let's take a look at just some tactical considerations with this battle map that we've drawn. First of all, I don't like it. It doesn't really, it's not a good map for us. The reason is we start on the bottom of the map and we move up and they start on the top of the map and move down a little bit more aggressively than we do by the way that the AI routines work. So if you'll notice, they can get to this town in the middle and just pick us off in the open if we stay where we are. So we have to find cover, which kind of leaves us two options. Option number one, is that we could move up into this town on the left-hand side here, try to hole up into these, uh, this village, but that's gonna leave us all at short range, which isn't gonna be ideal for our tanks. We don't really want that. We wanna be able to fire at range. So I think our better option is going to be to come down here into this bocage on the bottom right and set up there. And hopefully what'll happen is the AI with their routines are gonna advance up into these two open squares and we'll have some good shots in the first couple turns of the battle to be able to fire. Now, what I'm afraid of though, is that the AI routines are going to get them stuck 
the enemy's going to advance, and they're going to just stop in this bocage here. And if you'll notice, one of the conditions of bocage is that enemy can only be attacked at range 0 or range 1, which means we're just staring across at each other at this open space. Now, further compounding the situation is that one of the special rules of the scout force is that we can't attack them in turn 1, which means that it could be a whole different tactical situation before the fighting starts. But we'll make the best of what we can do with this map. We're just going to have to try to deal with it as best we can. With that in mind, we're going to start all our forces in the southeast corner of the map, and we're going to move Sergeants Kelly and Graham and their squads up into the Bocage. They can move one or two squares as part of their opening setup. Our armor can't do that, so they're going to have to stay in the southeast corner. Next step is to set up for the enemy. Now, one thing that we didn't talk about is that for the tanks, for the German tanks in this scenario, there's a randomization uh, element that mechanic that you use to determine what types of tanks are in the enemy force. And the way this works is we're playing a scenario in 1943. So we're taking five Panzer III tanks, four Panzer IV tanks, just one Tiger tank, which is the most dangerous tank available to the Germans in 1943, and then two Stu G's tanks. And so we're gonna put these into a bowl um, counters for each one of these, and then we're going to randomly pick two of those out to determine which two types of tanks are going to be represented in the scout force for this battle. Okay, I'm, I'm getting a sense that the uh, random combat gods are, are not going to be in our favor for this battle. We've drawn a uh, Panzer III, which is the weakest tank in the battle. That's a good thing. There are five of those in the bowl. We did, however, also pick the one Tiger tank. So uh, it'll be uh, Stuart versus Tiger. Um, what could possibly go wrong? But now probably is a good time to talk a little bit about what all these numbers mean on the units. So let's take a look at this rifle unit just to kind of get an idea for how the, the information on this unit works. So in the bottom left-hand corner, we can see the name of the unit, which is a rifle. And then we've got the icon that represents just a visual graphic for the, the image, for the unit. The top left corner is its victory point. Uh, um, value, which is going to be important for determining when a battalion falls to half strength and when a battalion is officially wiped out and the battle could possibly end. Then the top right is the combat values for attack for the unit, and there's four of them there. So the first two on the left are the range, and then the black number eight is the two hit number, the unmodified to hit number if it's firing at armor. So it can only fire at hard targets when they're in the same hex and it has an eight, nine, or a 10 on a 10-sided uh, on a 10-sided die to hit. So that means a 30% chance that this unit can hit unmodified at armor in its own square, but it can't fire at armor more that, that's not in its own square. The top two right numbers with the red indicator there means that for soft targets, it could fire at range zero or one up to range one, and it needs a five or greater on a 10-sided die roll to hit. So basically a 60% chance it can hit soft targets when firing at those at a range one or less. The bottom right number is its defense value of a three, and we'll talk about how that works as we get an example closer to combat. We can see here too now how just deadly this Tiger tank is because it's got a range of three. If there's only one range number, so this three basically refers to it can fire at all targets up to range zero to three. The left number is a two, which means it has a 90% chance to hit armored targets unmodified and an 80% chance to hit soft targets modified. We can see, uh, yeah, so this is, <laughs> it's a very unfortunate draw to be going up against a Tiger tank. So the next step is basically to set up the enemy units and there's a randomization die roll that you use to determine where the units end up. We've got, unfortunately, this isn't the greatest thing because we have the softer targets, the trucks in the back, which are basically target practice. And then the enemy armor is all up here in the front row, as well as their rifle units and armored cars. So it's a pretty aggressive uh, setup for the German forces, which is going to make it tricky on us. The next step to determine is that some of these units have an automatic advance move as part of their setup. And so we're going to do that. Then we'll take a look at the battle map. So here is the starting setup for our battle. As part of the start, the enemy rifle units advance two squares to our nearest unit. So one ended up in the Bocage and one ended up nicely for us, I think, in this space between the two, although it will be able to attack. The machine gun units advance one. Everything else stays where it is. This battle is ready to begin. It's not the greatest setup for us here. I'm hopeful we'll have a little bit of luck and get through this. We haven't talked yet about how the battles work and let's do that now as we start up. So each battle by default is five turns. However, one thing that we can do as part of our initial force purchasing is to purchase what are called scout units. 
and they cost one special option point each. And I did buy two of those, so our total expenditure ended up being 90 points instead of 88 points. And you can attach a scout to a battle to lengthen the battle by one turn. Because in this battle, the enemy scout units, the enemy scout battalion, we can't attack it on the first turn. I was thinking four attacks by us is not gonna be enough to do a lot of damage. So I think we definitely wanna lengthen this battle. So we're gonna attach a scout to it. That will make the total battle length six turns for this battle. The last thing we need to figure out before we start the battle is the level of aggressiveness of the enemy battalion. We're gonna roll a 10 sided die and it's determined by the scenario. So we can see on a one to five, we're gonna use a six roll, a six, sided die for enemy movement. On a six to 10, we're gonna use a 10 sided die. And a 10 sided die is much more aggressive. It's more likely the enemy units are going to advance and attack. A, a six sided die, the enemy's gonna be a little bit more cautious. So let's roll and see how the enemy aggressiveness will turn out. A one, this is gonna be a relatively unaggressive enemy battalion. So the way combat works is there are basically three phases to it. There's an allied fast commander move and attack segment, then all the enemy units move and attack, and then there's an enemy, uh, an allied slow commander movement and attack. Now, all of our commanders are green or at best uh, average, so we don't have any fast commanders, which means that in this battle, the German forces are gonna move and attack first. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna move each unit and then it attacks. So we go through the enemy units one at a time, you move and you conduct that attack and then you move on to the next unit. The last thing we need to do based on the fact that that, that operational role we just did, the tactical role for the enemy tactical movement was not very aggressive. We're gonna roll a six sided die, look at the chart and determine how the enemy units are gonna move in this opening turn. We roll a four which means that depending upon the type of unit, enemies are going to advance to cover, move to adjacent cover, or hold their positions. So we'll go through and move each unit individually and talk about how that works as we go forward. Let's dig in and start with the enemy move. So let's move through and kind of take these in order. We'll start with the trucks in the back. Their order is to hold, so they will stay where they are at the back of the battle. Unfortunately, those are easy targets. It'd be nice if they moved forward for us. Let's next handle our enemy rifle units. So this first rifle unit is in Bocage and its movement orders are to move to adjacent cover. The only adjacent cover is this set hex here in the building, so we'll move it there. This unit here, adjacent cover, means moving either away from us one square or toward us one square. All of the other conditions are the same, so we have our pick here. For the sake of trying to kind of engage in some combat and destroy some enemy units, we're gonna assume this unit moves up into this Bocage and is going to attack our infantry here. So let's resolve that attack now. The rifle unit has two targets at same odds to hit. So it's going to pick the one with the lower defense, which is unfortunately our machine gun squad. So the rifle unit, its base attack, it needs a five to hit. However, it's moved. So it's going to subtract two from its die roll. However, it's in the same square as us. So it's going to add that movement bonus, that movement and firing penalty back in. So we're gonna subtract two and add two to its die rolls. It has two attacks. It needs fives or better to hit. Four and a two. Oh, the dice roll gods come in our favor here. No hits on our machine gun squad. Lucky us. Let's next move our enemy machine gun squads. Now this one here at the front actually has an adjacent cover order. And one of the conditions of that order is that you move to the highest defense, whichever it is available. So this is light defense of plus one. This is plus one. The city back here is plus two. So its movement orders take it away from us into this larger building. That might be to our advantage, but it's gonna be harder to get it out of there as well. This second machine gun unit has two places it can move to. One is the larger buildings here, which are closer to us. So we'll assume it will move to here. However, this unit also cannot attack because it's out of range. So we're done with the machine gun units. Now let's check the enemy armor. So next up, let's handle the enemy armored cars. That's these two units up here. And this is kind of a long range one. So I'm showing an overhead of it here. This is advanced. Uh, advanced to cover and it so it moves to the closest enemy unit which are these units here that has cover available so it's going to both of these armored cars will move up into this bocage and take advantage of its defensive opportunities now these units can attack and the way this is going to work is they are going to attack at the the, the unit that gives them, oh, actually, sorry, they can't attack at this infantry because it's in bocage so they're going to attack at these units down here um, 
they're going to pick, they both have the same defensive value, so we can pick who it attacks. So let's take uh, shots at the Stuart here for this one. So uh, the armored cars are going to attack at the Stuarts. They need a five to hit at range three. There is a two die roll penalty. They've also moved, so there is a one die roll penalty. So we're gonna subtract three from their die rolls. They need fives to hit. A two and a three. Subtracting three from this, it's not even close to hitting our Stuart. Sergeant Conksel survives the first two shots from the first armored car. Now let's take the shots from the second armored car. A one, a one and a three. Uh, the, these Germans can't shoot very well. Uh, Sergeant Conksel survives four shots on his uh, Stuart tank and the battle continues on. Next up, the enemy armor. We're gonna move the, this is advanced to cover, so we move to the closest enemy unit to a space that has cover, which of course means that these tanks are both going to move up. Our Panzer III and our Tiger are going to move up into this building structure here. And now let's take a look at what their attack options are. So both of our armor have moved up in here. The units it could possibly can see and possibly attack are our two armored units down here. However, the Panzer III tank only has a range of two, so it cannot attack and is done for the turn. However, the Tiger can. It has a range of three. So once again, Sergeant Consul Stewart is gonna come under fire. The Tiger will take two shots at st the Stewart tank. It needs a two to hit. However, it's moved, so it's gonna suffer a minus one penalty to its die roll, and the range is three, so it's gonna subtract two more from the die roll. So we need twos or greater to hit with subtracting three from the die roll. Subtracting three from the die rolls, the Tiger needs to roll fives or greater to hit. A one and a three. <laughs> the die roll gods are incredibly favoring us here now. Sergeant Consul takes six shots and none of them hit. That's some good fortune for us here in this first turn. Let's move now to our turn. One of the rules of this engagement, because it's a scout force, is that we can't attack in turn one. So our infantry units can do nothing and they're gonna stay where they are. Our armored units, are gonna move up under cover. So we're gonna move these up into the bocage. However, they cannot attack this turn. So that ends the allied turn. And with that is the end of turn one. Let's roll for the aggressiveness of the enemy move. A one. Oof, that's a very cautious move. The most cautious roll we can get. Hold, retreat to cover and retreat to cover. So let's see how that impacts the enemy movement. Again, the Germans will go first because we have all slow commanders in this turn. So our trucks are ordered to retreat to cover. Now this bocage square here for this truck is equidistant to, the, to our units. So this unit's not gonna move and this unit's not gonna move either. It has nowhere to go to retreat to cover. So these trucks are done, just kind of hanging out at the back of the battle. Likewise, these machine gun units are ordered to retreat to cover as well. This one has nowhere to go that's farther away and uh, has cover. So this one is equidistant, so it's gonna stay where it is. This machine gun, however, has an option to move far away that has cover. So we're gonna slide this one over into the city here, moving away from the battle, and it's done as well. So um, not only can these German units not shoot very well, they're, they're kind of <laughs> running away from us pretty quickly here. This is kind of an entertaining battle to start with. So next, let's do the enemy armored units because they're easy to do. The armored cars and the tanks are both in cover already and their orders are to hold. So they stay where they are. Now, because we're in Bocage, we can't be attacked from more than an adjacent square. So they can't attack. So they are out of action for this battle is for the rest of this turn as well. So now it's left to, re to resolve these infantry units. Let's take a look at how they're impacted. Our rifle unit is ordered to retreat to cover. So it will perform the same thing that the machine gun unit does, which is it'll mean it'll move backwards into that one. It can't attack anything, so it's done. This rifle unit will retreat to cover. So it's gonna head for this bocage. So it is just running away. It's gonna go here. This unit, however, can attack because it's next to our unit at a range of one. So the rifle unit's gonna attack our machine gun squad again, and let's resolve that combat. The enemy rifle unit will fire at Sergeant Graham's machine gun team. Needs a five to hit, but because it's moved, there's a two die roll penalty, so it needs sevens to hit. A nine and a five. Sergeant Graham's unit takes one hit and one misses. Let's resolve the hit now. To check to see the effect of the hit, we have to first to see if it's negated or not. The machine gun team has a defense of two 
in its invocage, so it is a three. It needs to roll a three or less to negate the hit. But the hit takes impact. So this is a good point now to talk a little bit about how the a little bit, a couple of con concepts in the game that I think are important to kind of consider as we, we resolve these battles. When an allied unit is hit, we're gonna pull a damage chip from a bowl and apply that damage to the unit. And these could be anything from catastrophic results where the whole team and the commander are killed, which is very unlikely, to no effect. So there's a great range of what happens when a hit finally gets through to a unit from the German side. Conversely, when we pass when if a hit that if a shot that we put on a German unit hits and isn't negated, that German unit is destroyed. So which means that oftentimes you're going to end up with a battle where you're going to destroy maybe say six to ten German units, and you're only going to lose one or maybe none of your units. So in that regard, the game has kind of almost like a world an old World War II movie kind of feel to it, where you know an Allied soldier could sit and shoot at ten German units and kill them all without taking any damage. So that makes that you know I think one of the important points here is that this is a game and not a simulation because of the way this combat is resolved a little bit differently. The second thing, as we can see already, is both with these damage jits in terms of what damage we pull and the die rolls, the dice rolls and luck play, play a pretty big role in this so far. We've been really lucky with the German attack so far in that they really haven't hit anything. They've had eight attacks and they've only got one hit through on us. But that can all change if we get a bad pull on the damage. So let's see what happens to the machine gun team as it takes its first damage. All right, so I pulled the damage chit out of the bowl and it is one stress. So Sergeant Graham takes another factor of stress. Its stress is up to two. He can withstand three stress and still be okay. So he's still functioning as normal, although stress is starting to pile up on Sergeant Graham. Finally, we get to attack. We're gonna have the machine gun unit, which is geared for hitting uh, soft targets, fire on this rifle unit and see what happens with that before deciding what Sergeant Kelly's gonna do with his rifle team. Then we're gonna have our two tanks fire on the German armor that's up in the city here, the Tiger and or the Panzer III. So let's resolve first this soft target. We're gonna have a machine gun team fire on this retreating German rifle squad. This is a pretty favorable attack for us. As we can see here against high explosive targets, uh, Sergeant Graham's rifle, uh, machine gun squad needs a two or greater to hit, so it's going to get two shots at this retreating rifle unit. Five and a four, both hit. So this rifle squad has to survive these two hits. Its defense, as we can see, is a three, so it needs to roll three or less on these hits to survive. A nine and a four, both get through. Because it's failed its check, this rifle unit is destroyed. And we've got our first casualty. Sergeant Graham has his first kill. So I have a confession to make. As I, 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 as I was looking at what targets the armor could attack, I thought the Stuart and the Wolverine could attack these armored units up here. I actually went ahead and resolved both battles. The Stuart knocked out the Tiger and the Wolverine knocked out the Panzer. And I think, wow, we had some amazingly good rolls. However, one consideration I missed was that the Stuart tank only has a range of two. So it can't attack these units. They're too far away. I feel like the only fair thing to do is to undo that and to, to redo this portion. I was thinking to keep the dice rolls, but that just seems a little bit cheesy. So we're gonna have to do these attacks again, or at least the first one. So we're gonna have the Wolverine is gonna fire now on the Tiger instead, which is a really tough attack. I wish we could keep the earlier dice rolls, but we can't. So Tawanda fires, it needs an armor piercing is five. It's firing at range three. So we're gonna subtract two from the die roll. However, Tawanda is a good shot, adding one to the die roll at range one or greater. So Tawanda needs sixes or better to hit the tiger. Eight and nine. Oh, the luck continues. Two hits on the tiger. Now to see if the tiger is destroyed or not, it has to roll its defense values. Right now it's in this, it's got a defense of four. Whoops, it's flying all over the place. Defense of four, but it's in heavy terrain. So we're gonna add two. It needs sixes or less to survive on both hits. Hopefully our luck can continue. A 10, a zero is a 10. The 10 hits and the tiger is destroyed. So even though we redid this one, we managed to get a pretty good kill on a big unit for us. That's helpful. So at the moment, neither uh, Conskill Stewart or Sergeant Kelly's rifle squad has any targets. We could advance, but I think it's worthwhile to wait to see what happens with the German move on the next turn to see if some targets are gonna emerge. So we're gonna have them hold their positions. Let's roll for the enemy movement on turn three. A one, gah! 
Once again, the enemy will be cautious. This actually doesn't work to our advantage because we want them to advance towards us. So this is actually a very easy move for the <laughs> Axis forces. The trucks and the infantry are all ordered to retreat to cover, but they are as far as away as they can get or they can't move to cover, so the move doesn't apply to them. The armored cars and the panzers all have orders to hold, so they'll hold. Nothing for the acts of the Germans can attack because we're in Bocage, they would have to be next to us. So they can't attack. So the German turn is done. It's our turn now. As we head into the allied half of the turn, now's a good time to explain exactly kind of what we're trying to do to try to win this scenario. So we're, the important factors we're looking at are these two numbers above the victory point total, which is a nine and a four. At nine points of total strength, this scout force falls to half strength. At four points of total strength, this unit is destroyed. So ideally, we're trying to get it down to four total strength points. And these strength points are the top left number in these units. So right now, we've only destroyed a couple. This scout force has 14 total points left. If we add up all the values of these top left uh, digits on the remaining units that are still functioning. So it's at 14. We have to get it down to at least nine to reduce its strength to half strength, which will get us half of this victory value. And if we can get it down to four, the unit's wiped out and we get all of it. So what that means is we can't sit around and wait. We don't win if we wait. We have to push the attack. We're going to have to go forward to try to take out more units. So we're going on the offensive. There's no doubt about it. This is going to be risky, but we're going to have to move forward. First, we're going to send our Stuart with uh, Sergeant Conksville. It's going to go. He's, they have a movement of two. They're our fastest unit. We're going to advance them, crash them into the Bocage to attack one of these armored cars. So... To figure out, Kongsil needs a 7 or greater to hit. He's moved, so he's at a minus 1 penalty. But because he's in the same hex as the armored car, he gains that penalty back. So 7s are above to hit. Two shots. 4 and a 5. Ah, Stuart misses both. Next, we'll move forward Sergeant Tawanda and his Wolverine, pushing them up. They can only move one into this open space. They're going to attack one of the armored cars as well. Because Tawanda has moved and it's a minus 1 penalty, they need a 5 to hit. So they need a six, but uh, Tawanda also is a good shot, adds one to his dice roll. So they need fives or better to hit two shots. A nine and a seven, both hit. Excellent. Armored cars have a defense of two. It's plus one for the Bocage. They need threes or better, to threes or less to survive both shots. Six and a four, neither one is negated. The armored car is destroyed. With this destroyed armored car, Tawanda now has got his second kill of the battle. A hero is in the making. Next, we have to decide what to do with our infantry units. I think we need to press the attack. We, we have to push forward, and we're starting to see the scout force get weakened. So we're going to move both the machine gun squad and Sergeant Kelly's uh, rifle squad forward into the gap, try to get them up into the bocage. If they were to attack, they would both suffer, suffer stress, so we're not going to have them attack. They're going to just, just advance and not attack. And with that, it brings us to the end of turn three. With that, we've approached the halfway point in the battle, and given that we're close to 30 minutes now and I want to keep these under half an hour, we're going to finish the rest of this battle in episode three. So sorry that we weren't able to get through the whole thing, but I'm kind of learning about length as we go forward. As the situation stands right now, though, we've done pretty well. I mean, we've knocked out that rifle squad and armored car and taken out the deadly tiger. But as the Germans start up turn four, this Stuart's going to take some strong attacks by this armored car and by, by this panzer tank. And if these infantry units get advance orders and were to move up into here, then all of our units, including this infantry in the open, is going to get shot at as well. So we could be in a very dangerous dangerous position in turn four. The Stuart most likely is going to get at least one or two hits on it. Then it's up to us to see if we can go forward to take out more damage on the on the squad here. We've got quite a bit of work to do in the last three turns to eliminate it as we have to get it down to four points. And as of right now, it's still at 12. So we have a lot of damage left to, left to deal if we're going to wipe this unit out. So that brings us to the end of episode three. And just to respond to a few people mentioning on Twitter, we can't have cats. Here's living proof that we do have cats. And he's also a little bit hefty, so he doesn't make the jump up onto the table anymore. So I think our battle situation will be safe from Catzilla while we're away. A couple of quick things, a pretty good battle. I'm, I'm, I'm happy how things have gone so far, but we're in a precarious position for the back half. We're gonna need some luck to make it through the next turn without damage. Um, also, if you'd like to be a commander in the battle, we still have some infantry units available. So just put your name down in the comments and say that you'd like to be a commander of an infantry unit. You don't have to do anything. 
or know anything. All you have to do is just get your name in the battle is kind of make it a little bit more interesting. Lastly, over the 4th of July, I'm going to be unable to make videos for about seven or eight days. I think our next episode is going to be July 10th. So sorry about the delay between now and the next episode, but I think after that, going forward, hopefully about two, three episodes a week as we go on, as we kind of move through this. So it should be pretty consistent after that, but I do have to take a little bit of a break now. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. If you're new, please consider subscribing and we'll see you for the dramatic conclusion to our first battle in about 10 days. Take care, everybody.